If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. If anyone had told me the things I now know about the Catholic Church when I was a seminarian or a young priest, I would have been outraged, would have plugged my ears or would have run. I would have not believed such charges and would have regarded them as authored by the devil. I had been brainwashed against all such things. He goes on to say, at 16 years of age, I entered the seminary where I applied myself diligently, and at the age of 28, he was ordained a Roman Catholic priest. He goes on to say, I went forth into the field doing as I was told, wanting nothing more than to increase the church, desiring to live and die a Catholic priest, and perhaps even become a saint. I had been a priest about five years when, I ch when a change began to come over my life. I was not at peace. Dr. Bartholomew Brewer is my guest tonight. Dr. Brewer, welcome finally to Impact. Thank you very much. Well, it's good to have you with us. And I want you, if you will, just to take a few minutes here at the beginning. And um, those are very startling uh, words that I just read, especially if you're a Roman Catholic that's sitting out there listening tonight on the radio program. Uh, what, uh, why don't you just go back and give an overview of your testimony, and then we can go further into the program. Well, Pastor, I was born into a, a very devout Roman Catholic family. In fact, we went to Mass every day. And there was weekly confession, the, the, the daily recitation of the rosary, uh, respect for Catholic priests and Catholic nuns. In our family, there was a God consciousness and a Christ reference. So as a result, Pastor Bullock, uh, I went away to a Carmelite seminary. And during that time, I had no reservation about Catholic theology, had no doubts about my vocation to the Roman Catholic priesthood. So I was ordained a Roman Catholic priest uh, in the Carmelite order and was a Roman Catholic priest for 10 years, in good standing, by the way. And it was during my time in the chaplaincy in the U.S. Navy as a chaplain, as a priest, when I started to think for myself, by the way, that was not a very easy thing for me to do because Catholicism teaches that it is intellectual pride to question any of the basic dogmas or foundational teachings that are part of the Roman Catholic institution. So it was not very easy, it was not pleasant for me to question a number of the Roman Catholic teachings. And by the way, the Catholic priests that I knew in the uh, chaplain corps did the same thing. So that by the time I was done with my fourth year in the, in the uh, U.S. Navy as a priest, as a chaplain, uh, I, I really felt it would be hypocr hypocritical for me to continue as a Roman Catholic and even as a Roman Catholic priest. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I felt it would be hypocritical, it would be unethical for me to continue. And I think we find that today. We find what they call a ministroni Catholicism, a cafeteria Catholicism, where a lot of Catholic people today, Pastor Bullock, they profess to be Roman Catholic, and yet they are very selective about what they believe. And I, I felt that either I had to be under the authority of Rome as I, I, as I was, as a seminarian, as a monk, as a priest, or, or the opposite. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, after I was done with my time in the chaplaincy, uh, I started to uh, study the scripture. Uh, I didn't know that much Bible. In 12 years of formal study, my transcripts prove that I only had 12 semester hours of Bible study. And I don't think that should really startle anyone because Historically speaking, uh, the Bible is not pr primary in the Roman Catholic Church because basically Catholicism is a metaphysical, philosophical, uh, tradi a traditional uh, religious system. It is not biblical uh, in the strict sense of the term. Mm -hmm. 
So because because I didn't know that much Bible, I I, I felt I had to to study uh, this point. Where is my ultimate authority? And over a period of a short time, I discovered that absolutely Christ adhered to the Scripture. In other words, he settled every argument by saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. And Peter and Paul did the same thing. But to make a long story short, uh, I transferred my final authority from a religious system to the Scripture. In other words, I did have a change of attitude toward the Bible, because really it's a Roman Catholic priest. And I say this with, with love and tenderness, uh, the Catholic Church has a very clever way of depreciating the Scripture. Because really, no, no book in the universe exposes Roman Catholic dogma like the Word of God. Even, even a Catholic Bible it really is an anti-Roman Catholic book. So um, I had a change of attitude toward the Bible. I went away to a Protestant seminary, and it was in that seminary that I started to get into the scripture, especially Romans and Galatians, and it was startling to discover to the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit that indeed I was religious, but I was on my way to hell. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that I was not born again the, the biblical way because Rome's soteriology absolutely is antithetical to, the, to uh, New Testament theology. Mm. Uh, the, what I'm trying to say in love is that the Catholic Church absolutely promotes a complicated scheme of salvation is by faith and works. And yet if we take the totality of God's word, we see that Christ alone is the forerunner in Hebrews 6.20. In 10.20 it says Christ is the new and living way. In other words, Christ is enough. Mercy and grace is only found in Christ, not Jesus plus Mary, not uh, Jesus plus the sacraments, or not Jesus plus my human effort or human striving. But anyway, it was in that seminary that I did receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And we say personal because he alone is the mediator, as it says in 1 Timothy 2.5. So I did repent of my own sin and uh, really uh, I was a religious Pharisee I could not understand that I was that I was not a Christian that was a very difficult thing for me to understand that I was not uh, a Christian by biblical uh, definition so I had to repent of my own self-righteousness and I had to believe in Christ and to believe means to accept completely the atoning work of Christ on the cross to to trust his work 100% for me mm. on the cross. So Amen. in a few words, Pastor, that's how I became born again the Bible way in opposition to the Roman Catholic definition of salvation. Now your ministry is involved in helping Roman Catholics to yes, see. that's right. Uh, to to persuade them to be objective and to be honest with the Scripture apart from human tradition, because Catholicism does reject biblical sufficiency, and yet God teaches that the Scripture is complete and sufficient from hmm. cover to cover. Wow. Not the Bible... Uh, not the Bible, plus what they call tradition, mm. human tradition. If you just tuned in with us, I'm talking to Dr. Bartholomew Brewer, who, uh, as you just heard, was formerly a Roman Catholic priest, no longer a Catholic priest, and uh, has become a Christian. I, you are a priest now, though. Ever, all of us are priests, yes. Dr. Brewer. <laughs> yes, that's true, Pastor. <laughs> but no longer a Roman Catholic priest. And Dr. Brewer, we're going to take our first call. We're going to talk to Michael. Good evening, right, Michael. Pastor. Michael, are, are you there? Yes, I am. Pastor. Thank you for calling. You're uh, on Dr. the air. Dr. Brewer, I have a question. Um, saying that the Catholic Church isn't based solely or stri uh, strictly on stricture, I'm sorry, scripture, 
can you make a distinction then from the Catholic Church and say any other cult movement that has religious overtones but isn't really based on scripture? Could you repeat that, Pastor, please? Well, my question is, if oh. Catholic dogma is not based entirely on scripture, right. but it has overtones of tradition, right. is there really any distinction between, say, the Catholic Church and, for example, the New Age movement, which is, has a lot of religious overtones, uh, but it isn't based on scripture itself? Okay, okay. are you asking, let me, maybe let me rephrase it, are you asking then, in light of other cults that do not base their beliefs on scripture, would he put that in the same mold as a cult? Uh, well, given, uh, yes, uh, I would. Defined, if you define the cult broadly as any religious system oh. that isn't based strictly on scripture, would you say that, for all intents and purposes, that Catholicism at least tends towards that direction? Okay. Dr. Burke, can you answer that? Well, let's put it this way, Michael. I really believe that Catholicism, uh, Roman Catholicism has uh, characteristics in, or marks in common with religious cults. For example, uh, and, I, and I realize it all hinges on a person's definition of a cult, but I do believe there are certain outstanding characteristics. For example, twisting the scripture, I believe, is, is a great mark of every religious cult. And Second Peter 3.16, Peter warns about those who, those who twist the writings of St. Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, Paul, St. Paul, the Apostle Paul, warns about those who corrupt the Word of God. And really, if you look at Roman Catholic teaching and compare it, even with the Catholic Bible, you can see that Catholicism is, is one of the great twisters of Scripture. And then we have, you have extra-biblical revelation, you have salvation by works, you have a distortion of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Uh, we don't have time to go into that. But there, there are many other characteristics that, that I believe Roman Catholicism has indeed, has in common, you know, with the other cults. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say by, by biblical definition, the way I see it, uh, Roman Catholicism is, is, a, is a cult. Okay. Um. My question is for someone who is uh, working in good faith to find the, the true meaning of the Bible. Uh, yes. When you look at the different Protestant sects, and each one has a different interpretation of Scripture, how do we know that, say, Methodism or Baptism isn't doing the exact same thing, each one having its own twist on what Scripture is saying? Well, first of all, Michael, I think that we can exaggerate some of the differences between, uh, let's say, some of the, I use the word Protestant, uh, generically, but I think sometimes it's very easy for a Roman Catholic to exaggerate uh, some of the differences among the uh, different Protestant uh, groups. Uh, you see, when we talk about, uh, you mentioned Methodism. Right. Well, uh, Methodism today is closer to Rome than Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Much of Methodism is apostate. Right. as is the Roman Catholic religion. So we've got to make, I believe, a formal distinction between Roman Catholicism and, and, and true biblical New Testament uh, Christianity. Right. So I, See, I, the issue is Jesus Christ and his written revelation. Okay. Well, thank uh -huh. you very much. Michael, thank you for Go calling. On. We're talking to Dr. Bartholomew Brewer, a former Roman Catholic priest, He's written his life story in a book called Pilgrimage from Rome. You're on the air, Justin. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, as a former Roman Catholic myself who is, uh, has accepted Christ as his personal Savior also, um, the thing that I wanted to ask about was the Roman Catholic Church's stance on the, uh, the origin of papal authority. And I'm referring to the scripture where uh, Christ was saying, you are Peter to Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I've heard several good explanations of that, that uh, Christ was not talking about Peter being the rock of the church, but Christ himself is the rock of the church. How has the Catholic Church uh, reconciled that statement with um, true biblical, you know, the, the real biblical foundation and their uh, basis for saying that, uh, you know, Peter was the pope and he was the founder of the church, not Christ? Dr. Brewer? Well, first of all, uh, Justin, 
Matthew 16, verses 13 through uh, 20, is not so much about Peter, but rather about the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Because, you see, in all things he must have the preeminence as it says in Colossians chapter 1, right toward the end of verse 18. So uh, here, Peter is acknowledging Jesus Christ to be the incarnate Son of God. And because Peter makes that confession, the true church of Jesus Christ is founded on that basic premise, that Christ is God in the flesh, you see. I understand. So that that is, uh, I believe, uh, a very proper interpretation. And also, like you said before, uh, in the in the Old Testament, God, the God of Israel, is that rock. And then we come into the New Testament, and even Paul himself, for example, I think that's First Corinthians chapter ten, around verse four, then First Corinthians three nine through eleven. Paul himself says Christ is that rock. Now, what I find interesting is that in the person, first epistle by Peter, in the second epistle by Peter, I mean, he says nothing about uh, uh, papal supremacy, about having uh, temporal and spiritual authority over other churches. First of all, in the, in the, under the gospel dispensation, there is no sacrificing mediating priesthood. Peter and Paul were never Roman Catholic priests, and, 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 and it's tragic to put on Peter the theory that he was ever a pope. And really, this is based on three assumptions. Number one, Peter was the bishop of Rome. Number two, as I just said, Peter became some, he was some kind of supreme leader. And number three, that the pope succeeds to his office and authority, see, uh, I mean, all the apostles were equal. That's the way I see it in St. Matthew chapter 23, verse 10 and 11. And Peter nowhere alludes to supremacy. And Peter, uh, sent, he, Peter was sent by the other apostles to Samaria. And we know at the Jerusalem Council, I think in, in Acts uh, around chapter 16, or 15 or 16, mm -hmm. I mean... Uh, Peter is not the leader. James is the leader. And then we see in the context of, of the New Testament that, that indeed it's Peter and James and John as pillars uh, of the church founded by Jesus Christ. I understand that. I just kind of wonder why doesn't the Catholic Church realize that? Well, uh, Justin, it, it's because the Catholic Church rejects the principle that the Bible is a self-interpreting book. If the Church of Rome were to accept that hermeneutical, that apostolic, the apostolic hermeneutic, that the Bible expounds the Bible, then the papacy would have to go. You see, it's the Bible and tradition and what they call the magisterium or the teaching authority of the Roman Catholic Church. And so when you have a uh, three sources of of, uh, of authority, you can justify uh, this theory that, uh, you know, what is known as apostolic succession. Right. We have to remember, too, that uh, there are certain fraudulent, fraudulent, uh, uh, for, what do you call them, forgeries, uh, uh, that the Clementine forgeries and this Adorian decretals made it possible for this idea that there was a bishop in Rome and that he had universal jurisdiction mm -hmm. over other bishops. Uh, these things developed, you see, over, over centuries of time. The Catholic Church does not stand on the scripture alone. I mean, if she did, there would be no Roman Catholicism. And that's a tragedy that they don't. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Well, Mike, well right. thank you for your time, and uh, I wish you well, and God bless you in your ministry. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for calling. I had a question earlier, Dr. Burr, that somebody asked me that um, I want to uh, go. I wrote it down so I'd make sure I'd ask for them. They wanted to know, uh, uh, now that they've become a Christian, do you think that they ought to go back into the Catholic Church to be a missionary? 
Well, Pastor Bullock, there's no biblical support for that uh, for that uh, concept. God's methodology is that we are not to be unequally yoked. We have that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 14. In St. James' Epistle, chapter 4, verse 4, speaks about spiritual fornication. In the, the book of the Apocalypse in my Catholic Bible, chapter 18, and verse 4, it says, Come out of her, my people. So uh, God's methodology is that we are to separate from uh, false religion, religious apostasy, and then from the outside we evangelize people. So, uh, so that that's God's methodology. That's that's His technique right there. As that we go outside the camp, so to speak, to suffer with Him, and from outside the camp we proclaim the Word of God. Come you know, out we, of her, my people. We see sometimes on the television, which I'm sure you have seen. Uh -huh supposedly a Roman Catholic priest born again, but still ministering, quote, in the same capacity with the same rituals and tradition. How do you respond to that? Well, we have to understand that, that uh, for a born again priest, that's a, that's a contradiction in terms. Uh, there's, there's no such individual. Uh, they're born again the Roman Catholic way through baptismal regeneration, which is heretical, and, 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 uh, and upon reception of the other sacraments for sanctifying grace. The, in other words, the Catholic Church has an anti-biblical definition for born again. So when a priest stands up there and says he's born again, he doesn't mean what the Bible teaches about biblical salvation. Mm. Uh, when a priest really gets born again the Bible way, and we're going to meet one, tomorrow, who's been born again only four, uh, just four years now, when a priest gets born again the Bible way, he begins to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, he gets grounded in the scripture, and in God's time, he has no choice but to, to surrender at the cross, salvation by works, he must surrender at the cross, the mass which is pagan and absolutely idolatrous. It is a mockery of what Jesus did on the cross, what he said in John 19, uh, 20, I believe, or is it verse 30, Christ said, it is finished. Mm. So uh, when, when these priests talk about being born again, uh, we have to remember that they have an anti-biblical uh, understanding of what it means to be born again, because in the Catholic religion, salvation is a process. You're born again. You could be born again 50 times or 100 times in one year. We're going to talk to Kent. Good evening, Kent. Uh, yes, hello. I'm, I'm sorry I uh, tuned in a little later, but you might have covered this. But in our local paper here in Austin, we had an article about the Pope's impending visit to Mexico uh -huh. and how the, the uh, Roman Catholic Church, which is so monolithic in Mexico, um, is, you know, in past years been uh, in competition with uh, evangelical uh, uh, Protestant religion or Christianity. And uh, it was kind of interesting as a sideline. They lumped the Jehovah's Witness in with the with the evangelical Christianity, which I thought was kind of ironic. But at any rate, um, I just wondered if if uh, the guests had any comments on on the Pope's impending visit and uh, and the state of Roman Catholicism in Mexico and uh, uh, Central and South America in general. And I'll I'd just like to hang up and you know hear a comment or two. Dr. Burr, you want to respond to that? Anything? Yes, Pastor Bullock, uh, my wife and I, Ruth and I, just read in a Catholic publication, a Roman Catholic publication, about five months ago, where it said that uh, the Catholic religion is, the Catholic denomination is losing 200,000 Catholics every month in Central and Latin America to different Protestant groups. And so recently, the Catholic bishops, uh, some Hispanic bishops from this country and also some Catholic bishops in Mexico and other Latin countries have, uh, have had a very urgent uh, conference to determine how do we handle the uh, Bible Christians who are proselytizing, that's their term, uh, how do we handle these individuals who are soliciting our people? 
So Catholicism is in serious trouble in Central Latin America, also here in uh, North America, and all over the world. The, the Roman Catholic Church is losing its control on the minds of the people. There is rebellion on the part of the Catholic people. Uh, they feel that they've been exploited. They, many of them feel that they've been seduced. And so, therefore, it's very urgent for Mr. John Paul II to go to Mexico because even in Mexico, where there, there is a form of godliness, uh, uh, Catholicism is in serious trouble. My co-worker is an ex-Catholic priest from Mexico, and he will tell you the same thing that uh, here, for example, in America, the Catholic Church has lost one million Hispanics in 15 years. Wow. So uh, not only in central, central Latin America, but also here in North America, the, uh, the Catholic Church is losing many, many Hispanic people. We're going to talk to uh, Julie, uh, Dr. Brewer. Um, What's your name? Julie. Julie, are you the... Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Right. You're on the air. my call. Okay. Um, I had a question. Um, I'm an ex-Catholic also. And in regard to the focus on Mary and in light of uh, Revelation 17, I was wondering if y'all think that um, that they might that the Catholic religion might be headed toward more of a goddess religion. Um, my fam most of my family is still Catholic, and um, some of them have flocked to Yugoslavia to see visions of Mary, and they have uh, lots of statues. And um, a lot of the mail I get is always... You know, speaking about Mary and, and idols. So your question is, is the Roman Catholicism headed for goddess worship? Is that what you're asking? Yes, and if, and if you believe that that is uh, the prophecy in Revelation. All right, Dr. Burr. Well, Julie, I never thought of it that way. However, I think we have to remember in the light of Scripture that, uh, as you know, thank God, Christ is enough. But he is not enough in the Roman Catholic Church mm -hmm. because not only are there the sacraments, but there is Mary. Imagine, Mary is said to be the co-redeemer. Right. See, and I have a Catholic book that says Mary is the way of salvation. <laughs> now, I know our dear Catholic friends don't like to hear uh, when we say that there, is, that there is Mary worship, but there is. If we're going to be realistic and honest, uh, there is Mary worship. They, they deify Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, Really, the Mary, the Roman Catholic religion, the way I see it, is not the humble maiden that gave birth to Jesus Christ, my personal Savior. Right. So uh, I believe that uh, there is so much uh, idolatry uh, regarding Mary and the Church of Rome. All these apparitions, absolutely, uh, whether it's Medjugorje in Yugoslavia, where... Uh, we had meetings not long ago, uh, whether it's in Our Lady Guadalupe in Mexico City, Lourdes in France, Fatima in Portugal. These things are, are part of the occult, mm -hmm. uh, O-C-C-U-L-T, which is rampant in the Roman Catholic religion. Wherever you have a false gospel, precious people are liable to seducing spirits. And this would be true of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Would you suggest then, in speaking with Catholics, when they talk about Mary, if, if we stress the fact that, that she was being obedient rather than, um, you know, on a pedestal? Yes. That, I think, Julie, we have to let Catholic people know that we're not against Mary, but Mary must have her proper place, right. you know? And, um, uh, again, Colossians 1.18, it says that Christ is preeminent, see, he alone is the mediator. We have that Ephesians 2.18 and uh, 1 Timothy 2.5 and, and throughout the epistle to the Hebrews. The emphasis is on Christ. And uh, I, uh, I think that once the Catholic will understand that we have a perfect Savior who did a perfect work on the cross, then Mary does not become the, the issue. We will honor Jesus by obeying him like like you know, she said. All right. Good evening, David. Are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you for calling. You're on the air. Uh, yes, doctor. Uh, I was uh, calling to ask you a question that uh, I heard a Catholic priest uh, uh, said that uh, you can pray to Mary because of uh, 
Uh, Luke, uh, I believe it's Luke 2, uh, 35, where they say, uh, and the sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Could you explain that to me, why they twist that scripture? Okay, if we take the totality of God's holy word, which we must do in order to avoid uh, vandalizing the scripture, if we take the totality of scripture, the emphasis is on Christ. The emphasis is to come to him. You see what I mean? Yes, sir. Now, that scripture you gave me is not from, that's a scripture, but the interpretation comes from Roman Catholic saints and mystics and ascetics who were very sentimental about, about Mary. We have to understand that sentimentality has a way of, has a way of obscuring uh, plain truth. So uh, that text would have nothing to do about Mary being a mediator. You see what I mean? Uh -huh. Catholicism does teach that, because uh, I believe in being honest and fair about the Roman Catholic Church, so I want to say this. The Catholic Church does teach that Christ is the primary mediator and Mary is the secondary mediator. However, we don't see that kind of distinction in the Bible, you know? Uh -huh. There's only one mediator, see? And Vatican II, by the way, teaches that Christ is the absolute mediator and that we are all mediators in Him. But again, that's philosophy in vain deceit. We must stick with the objective content of, of God's Holy Word. Well, uh don't the Catholics believe that uh, Mary gives grace? Oh, yes. She is said to be our Lordess. She is said to be Mother of Divine Grace. She is not only said, said to be uh, a co-redeemer, but imagine, uh, she is said to be conceived uh, without original sin. Mm -hmm. In every situation, really, Mary is the, is the great revival, I mean, great uh, rival of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that's really tragic, because in the context of God's Word, it's not Jesus plus Mary. Christ is enough. Dr. Burr, we're going to talk to Jay on the line. Jay, are you there? Yes, I sure am. Thank you for waiting, and you're on the air. Thank you. Dr. Brewer, I want to address, address the issue of, uh, of uh, the word versus the walk. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a former Catholic, and, uh, and I'm a born-again Christian now, and one of the things that always struck me about the Catholic Church was it seemed that the, that the Catholics believed, and I one of them, that uh, your religion and going to church was one thing, but your lifestyle was another. And uh, I have, I have since, or during my, Christ, my uh, Catholic experience, I was even approached by, by priests, Catholic priests, who, who were homosexual. And uh, they, I know it's a touchy, a touchy topic, but they would actually, I mean, I've had advances made to me when I was in the youth organization in the Catholic Church by, by uh, homosexual priests. And it just, it just uh, and now that I'm out of it, it's even more clear, how can a Catholic, you know, uh, practice his religion and then live a lifestyle that is totally against the Word of God. Well, uh, but why not? You see, if a person is not regen has not be re been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, in other words, if a person has not been born again the Bible way, why, why would he not be liable, not only to religious idolatry and heresy, but also gross immorality or perversion? See, I think it's all part of the package. Yeah. You see what I, I mean? Yeah, I so, guess I guess what amazes me okay. in, in studying the not only my former faith, the Catholic Church, and other cults is is how easily they are deceived by such an obvious and blatant uh, affront to Christ and, and, and the scriptures. Very well said, and this is why in first John four it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit but try or, or test the spirits whether they are God, you know. Uh, it, you know, we live in a time, I think Isaiah said this a long time ago, when they are called good evil and evil good. And uh, so uh, whether it's, uh, 
uh, homosexuality among uh, Catholic priests, which is rampant, mm. uh, molesting children, uh, idolatry, salvation by works, is all part of the uh, of of uh, this mystery of iniquity, which uh, versus uh, the mystery of godliness. Mm. We have, you know, the the two different uh, camps. Right. That's the Catholic Church is also where I uh, was exposed to uh, drugs and also to alcohol. So, well, again, see, this this doesn't surprise me at all. I must say that during my time in the uh, in the minor seminary, and then later on in the major seminary, I I was not aware of any homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, but now you can even read Catholic publications about the fact that uh, uh, drug abuse, for example, alcoholism, these things are very common in Catholic seminaries today, and uh, also homosexuality. In fact, the Vatican is constantly mm -hmm. uh, looking into, uh, you know, situations of, of this nature. Right. Jay, thank you for calling. I will let you go and we'll go back to the phone line. Thank you for calling and your comment. You know, uh, Dr. Burry, in your book, before I go back to the phones, you made a statement that is very, uh, very true, that celibacy is totally against nature. Uh -huh. I mean, that's a pretty good statement. I mean, yep, but that's what they promote. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, consequently, that uh, this homosexuality or fornication is just a result of them trying to, quote, uh, deny the, uh, the nature that God has set up. Well, you know, they told us, I remember the two Latin words, contra naturam. They told us that, indeed, celibacy is against nature. But at the same time, I guess uh, they feel that uh, personal discipline and, uh, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, willpower, whatever, that a person can uh, uh, practice, you know, uh, uh, practice celibacy. I think we have to make, make a distinction between celibacy and chastity. Celibacy meaning no no family, and uh, but chastity is something else. And uh, in other words, a priest may be uh, very impure and yet be a celibate in the sense that he doesn't have a family. Yeah, and okay. that that is very common. Wow. Good evening, John. Are you on, you're on the air? Uh, yes. Uh, I returned from Mass about an hour ago. Uh huh. I was going to remind y'all that we are two are gathered in His name. Is there in the midst? Uh huh. Uh, that is my only purpose for calling. Okay. You you went to a Mass just a little while ago, and you said we were. You said that we were gathered there in His name. Uh, where was anywhere where two people are gathered in His name? Mm -hmm. He is there. Okay. Just a comment, or you don't have a question or anything? Mm -hmm. Well, would you like to comment on that, Doctor Brewer? Well, let me say that as a Roman Catholic priest uh, in good standing for 10 years, one of the last things I questioned was the sacrifice of the Mass, both for the living and for the dead. And it wasn't until I came to the Scripture with meekness, as it says in James 1.21, did I understand that absolutely the Mass is a mockery of what Jesus did on the cross because... In the epistle to the Hebrews, over and over and over again, it says he died once, once for all. Now, the Lord's Supper is indeed biblical. I mean, it's a memorial. But I think what our, my dear Catholic friends miss, until they really become objective with the Scripture, what they fail to understand, that the Lord's Supper was never a sacrifice. Christ paid that one sacrifice on the tree of shame. And so, for example, it says this in, uh, uh, oh, if I can find it right here in Hebrews, uh, chapter 10, for example, it, it, it says that by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We have that in 1 Peter 3.18. We have that in Romans 6.10. Over and over again, it says that the work of Christ was perfect and complete. There is no earthly sanctuary for today. There is no bloodless sacrifice for, to, for today, because without the shedding of blood, is no remission of sin. See, the Bible, John, well, makes it very clear that Christ offered that one perfect, never-to-be-repeated sacrifice, 
and that he alone was fit to offer that sacrifice. Well, and remember, his priesthood is very exclusive. It cannot be given to you or me to offer some sacrifice every day, both for the living and for the dead. Well, I don't dispute with you that there are... A little louder, please. Uh, I don't dispute with you that there are corrupt priests. I'm sorry, I can't hear. Uh, he says he doesn't... He says he doesn't uh, dispute with you that there are corrupt priests. Go ahead. What's the rest uh, of it? But uh, I would like to say that uh, there are many Christians who attend Catholic Church, and uh, I don't think you have a right to say they're going to go to hell. Okay. Uh, yeah, you say there are Christians inside the Catholic Church? Yeah, that's what he said. He said, and he said okay. And that you didn't have a right to say they were going to go to hell. Well, John, let me make myself clear, because I don't want to misrepresent the Roman Catholic community. Uh, the word Christian is an umbrella term today. We have to give it a biblical definition. A Christian is one who is born again the Bible way. That doesn't mean through to water baptism or any other good work. You see, uh, uh, I would like to believe, John, that there are some Catholic people who are Christian. It, not because of it, but in spite of it. See what I mean? So we, we have to define our terms, and, uh, and, and I truly believe that if a Catholic is, is, a, is a biblical Christian, he's not a Roman Catholic by, by definition. And as he grows in his relationship with the Lord and gets grounded in the Holy Word of God, he will have no choice but to separate from the Church of Rome, which indeed has another gospel. John, let me, ask, let me ask you, John, do you, do you do you have a Bible and do you read your Bible? Uh, yes, sir, I do. You do read your Bible. Yes, sir. Nothing in the Bible disturbs you about Roman Catholicism. Well, sure. Uh, I don't believe in praying to the Virgin Mary and what have you. I mm. mean, it says, you know, and confession. Well, you don't need to confess to a priest. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why Christ died, of course. Mm -hmm. But the point is that I think certain people have to work within the church. You know, it's like not everyone can belong to just one religion. I mean, there are many good people who, who aren't just, say, Protestant, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, Have you been, have, do you know that, as Dr. Burr has brought out, have you been born again? Or, or, I mean, I'm talking about biblically, and not Roman traditionally, but uh, biblically. Uh, sure. Yes. I mean, I don't know exactly what you mean. Yeah. How did that happen? Was it, uh, John? No, he said he didn't. He doesn't know what we mean by it. That's oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, John, very briefly, uh, well, Dr. Burr, you tell him what it means to you. Well, to be born again means to embrace with the arm of faith the work of Christ on the cross for you. See, uh, apart from sacraments, you see, we have to remember, I try to make this simple, Catholicism teaches that the seven sacraments are channels of divine grace. That the more you participate in the sacramental life of the Roman Catholic religion, uh, the more grace you find, you see. But in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Well, let me say, any man should boast. You let me say I went to a, to a Baptist church once, uh -huh. and I didn't see much of a difference. Nothing at all. I mean, it's y'all have the same big mansion churches, you know. Yeah, but well, let me ask you this: uh, Did they did they did they have a mass? Uh, well, no. I mean, the preacher preached. Okay. And some people were they were saying they were going to the ministry, so they got up in front of the church. Uh huh. And they started asking them if they were willing to, uh, oh, why were they doing this when they know they wouldn't get rich or what have you? Uh huh. Uh, I don't know. It seems, I don't know. I don't really see much difference. Yeah. Well, I tell you one thing. Now, I I, I will speak for my own church, uh, John. That uh, I, I challenge you to come visit my church. I know you'll see a difference there. What church is that? That's Christ Memorial Baptist Church. Well, my point is this. Okay. How can you say that uh, both? Baptist, whatever, whatever religion it is, has huge churches, spend all this money on building, when uh -huh. there's people dying of hunger. Well, let me ask you this question, then. I, that's a good question. But uh, also, do you, think it's more, do you think it's more important that a man uh, 
is born again and goes to heaven, or he has a full stomach and dies and goes to hell. Well, I'm saying some people who, who are so hungry that they can't even receive anything else. You know what I'm saying? Okay, but if you feed them, what are you going to give them then? Well, I don't know. I guess, I mean, you'll never see the way, or I'll never see your way, or what have you. Well, all I would say to you, and I think Dr. Burr would echo the same thing, that anything you believe about God ought to be premised only on the Scripture. I, I agree 100%. Yeah. Reject. But I think that many people I've talked to who are also Catholics don't go around praying to the Virgin Mary or having these rosary beads hung around their neck or what have you. Mm -hmm. And there's, there are people there who know the right way. Mm -hmm. But, I mean... I don't know if you're born into that, that's the way you should die. John, may I say this? And Pastor Bullock, may I say this? Yes. We want to be careful, John, that we're not simplistic or naive about Roman Catholicism. You must go into the primary sources to consider what the Church of Rome officially teaches and then what the Bible teaches. Well, they are no, no, one no. is antithetical to the other. So to say that Catholic people don't pray to Mary, I believe is, you know, uh, I'm sure you're not serious about that. Uh, I'm totally serious. That, and again, the issue is, is really not Mary. The issue is Jesus Christ, who alone is the Savior. Yes, I agree. Uh, without the Roman Catholic Mass. I agree. Well, then you're not a Roman Catholic by definition. Well, I, well first off, I don't put any labels on myself. If someone asks me what I am, I say... But the Pope says that either you are a Roman Catholic, that you accept all the official dogmas, or you are not. So I don't like your... Well, here's another question. Okay. Okay. When sure. I walk down the street, you can always walk into a Catholic church, but these Baptist churches always have their doors locked. Mm-hmm. And it seems to me that they do that because they want to keep bums, you know, out of, out of, like, on the drag. They don't want the drag inside the church. Mm-hmm. I mean, what? Shouldn't it be open to anyone? Why do you go? Why do you want an open church? It should be open to anyone. Why do you want an open church? Because it is the house of the Father. Is the house of the Father? Yeah. I mean, what? Why do you need an open church? Is my issue. Why? Yeah. So people can walk in. Well, right. You know, I have people come into mine all, uh, all the. Well, I say all the time. I walk through my auditorium many times. People, some are sitting in the auditorium praying. I don't know what Baptist church you've been looking at, John, but you sure had not looked at a lot well, of them. This is one here on UT campus. Well, I would find one off of UT campus, and uh, I, I would judge based on uh, on others. I got to go, John. Okay. I got one other caller. Thank you for calling. Uh, we're going to uh, try to get uh, Marilyn in uh, here. Last of all, Marilyn, are you there? Yes, I am. Very quickly. Okay, I am 52 years old, and I've been a Catholic all my life except for the last several years, and I've been going to a Baptist church. And my, pro I feel I'm a born-again Christian as of maybe two, three months ago. Mm -hmm. And my problem is I have a 21-year-old college daughter, only child, and, and I'm telling her about the Word and all this. Mm -hmm. And she says, Mother, I'm so mixed up because I sent her to Catholic school also as I had gone. And, you know, she is confused, and I'm trying to tread very, very lightly. And uh, what the last caller said, I am a Catholic. I mean, I have been a Catholic in the past, and I can tell you that Catholics do pray to the Virgin Mary, and we say rosaries and all of that. And my whole family in the past was Catholic, so I know that's true. I was married in the Catholic Church, the whole thing. Yeah. But my issue right now is with my daughter. All right, thank you for calling. Uh, she's got a daughter that uh, was yeah. raised. You, you heard the call. What would you say to her? Well, it's important to continue, for the mother to continue to encourage the daughter to get into the Word, because that's where the, the power is in John 15, 3. It says there is cleansing through God's Word. And the, and the Greek word is catharsis. The Word of God is a, you know, is a catharsis. Dr. Brewer, I want to thank you for being with us, yes, and I uh, wish thank you the you. very best in your ministry. God bless you. Thank you for listening uh, tonight. Check out our websites. BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam. 
a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available.